Okay. I think we should get started because we're kind of short on time. Um, and I would like to say welcome everybody. Hello, welcome to all of you joining us. Um, I'm Anna Reed and I'm Head of Research at the Paul Mellon Centre. Um, welcome to this first session of the Autumn Research Series titled British Art and Natural Forces, a State of the Field Research Programme. And it's on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Paul Mellon Centre this year. And this year is situated in the midst of crisis, this multi-part programme of, of research events focuses on transformational encounters between artistic or art historical practice and nature's forces, as well as the embodiment of those forces in the activities of British art studies. In that, it will foreground a range of the most vital activities and conversations taking place within the field. Details of more than 10 events in this series can be found on the PMC website where you can also sign up and a final panel discussion will take place on the 3rd of, of December, 3rd of December. Um, we're short on time, um, so this session of, of four papers will run till 2pm um, and I would like you to introduce you to our chair for today who is um, Martin Myrone. Welcome Martin. Uh, Martin's many exhibitions as a curator at Tate Britain have included John Martin in 2011. British Folk Art in 2014, and most recently William Blake in 2019. His published work includes this year's Making the Modern Artist, Culture Class and Art Educational Opportunity in Romantic Britain. Martin has recently joined the Paul Mellon Centre as convener of the British Art Network, which brings together curators, researchers and academics based around the UK and internationally to share expertise, research and ideas. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Martin. Great. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to um, be able to um, introduce today's speakers and uh, and chair this first session in British Art and Natural Forces. Um, we've got four speakers. Um, they're all here. They've all tested their slides. So we'll be running the programme um, as advertised with uh, Katarina uh, Franciosi and uh, Stephanie O'Rourke, uh, followed by a question session and then Joe Carr and Toba Auckland Peck with uh, questions for those papers. And if, if time allows, uh, questions for the entire panel right towards the end uh, as we uh, due to finish at two o'clock. Um, we have a, a housekeeping slide, which hopefully you can see, um, which uh, I won't go through in detail because you can see what's, what, um, uh, what it says there, but this is being run as a, a Zoom webinar, which means that um, you won't be seen and you won't be heard unless we, uh, um, uh, the hosts and um, let you in um, and to ask questions in those sessions after the each pair or each, each pairing of papers uh, we'd ask you to use the Q&A box um, um, or you can raise your hand and Danny and uh, Ella will be uh, monitoring those um, along with myself uh, during those sessions. The chat box is uh, to use primarily for any technical issues or any uh, kind of specific issues about about the the organization of the event. Um, the session is going to be recorded um, for the archive, um, but we'd ask you not to take photographs yourself, um, and it uh, almost goes without saying, but uh, any offensive behavior um, uh, won't be tolerated. Uh, we, will, um, we will kick you out <laughs> if, any of that, any of that, if that goes on, um, and I guess that's one of my roles as chair as well. Um, but the, but <laughs> sorry, that's ending on a rather negative note, but the main, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the main thing is to really um, welcome our attendees. We're up to um, seven, over 70 attendees, 73, 72 attendees, uh, and we know from a few names that I recognise on that list and from um, um, some notes that should, which have been sent through that this is, this is a, already an international event ranging from Bristol, uh, Brazil to, as I say, it probably is Bristol, which is lovely, um, uh, Brazil to Connecticut, to Greece, and um, all points between, I believe, um, as well as around the UK. Um, today's um, papers, um, a range across the 19th and 20th century and across a, uh, a range of quite a, a broad range of materials relating to geomorphic forces. Um, but it occurs to me as I was reading through the, the abstracts and what's promised from these papers that there may be um, rather interesting um, cross currents, uh, points of connection across these different times and periods and cultural contexts and, and media, uh, particularly in the relationship between was like a, kind of the solid and the not solid between dreams and spectacle and speculation um, and science and structure, the structured and the unstructured. That seems to seems to promise to play out um, in the course of 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 today's today's papers. 
as I say, we've, uh, we're, we're on a fairly tight schedule. So let's move straight on to our, our first paper, uh, which is from Katerina uh, uh, Angiosi. Uh, Katerina is, um, I'm going to refer to my notes. Oh, uh, is an incoming PhD student in the Department of History of Art at Yale University, uh, where she's going to be focusing on 19th century British art uh, um, uh, and uh, particularly the, the visual culture of landscape and the environment and its intersection with the history of science. Um, her uh, paper today, hey, I imagine it must derive, I think, from your, your, uh, your MA at the Court of History of Art on uh, Edward Byrne Jones and the Histories of the Earth and developed on that, which was awarded an outstanding prize for an, out, uh, a, a prize for an outstanding dissertation. Uh, and she was previously uh, awarded a BA in Art History from John Cabot University, Rome. Um, with that out of the way, um, straight over to you, uh, uh, Katerina, for your paper, Hell on Earth, Edward Byrne Jones, Perseus series and narratives of geophysical development. Thank you, Martin. Um, hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here to be part of this ambitious program. And of course, I wish we were all in the same room, but I will take uh, Zoom over nothing, I guess. <laughs> and I will get right into it. All right. The Perseus series by Edward Byrne Jones unfolds as a sequence of lunar settings that climaxes in a hyper decorative realm. In his multi part visual retelling of the Greek myth, we follow the hero as he performs a series of feats clustered around the slaying of the Medusa and the rescue of Andromeda from the sea serpent. Perseus carries out these tasks by incorporating a divinely made apparatus which lends him ultra speed and invisibility and shields him from the petrifying gaze of the Gorgon. In the first painting of the series, The Call of Perseus, Burton Jones brings together the two episodes that set Perseus' string of feats in motion. In the background, the naked hero is perched on a riverbank, crouching in despair after promising the King of Seraphus, the head of the Medusa, he's visited by the silver-clocked goddess Athena. In the foreground, the fully armored goddess grants her help to a hesitating Perseus, delivering him the mirror through which he can safely look at the Medusa and the sword with which he will behead her. Though Burn Jones uses compositional distance to establish a hierarchy of occurrence of the two episodes, the barren landscape with its sinuous bulges and recesses, confounds our effort to scan the scene sequentially. The bending and folding of regions of matter seem to be activated by changes in the viscosity of the rocks, an action of stretching or dilution of substances. It is a landscape of visual enigma. The metallic looking river, still and solid, the soft rocky river bank, the patch of soil in the foreground at once modeled by shadow and insistently flat, the crater-like socket behind Athena's majestic figure. These elements exist as pictorial moments of conflation of surface and depth, rendering the relationship between planar fields mobile. This range of discontinuities and movements of rocky substance is mirrored by Perseus's posture. He first doubles over and then stands in uncertain balance, the raised arm bent in protection and the rest of the body contracting inwardly. In this paper, I will look closely at the visual characterization of substances in the landscapes of the Perseus series and the relationship between the hero's action and the behavior of inert matter. This focus can productively awaken us to the ostensibly bizarre, yet utterly specific, geomorphological dimension of the environments in Burn Jones's series. I propose that these environments are informed by and respond to conceptualization of nature and the cosmos of 19th century physics of the Earth and the universe. 
I'd drawn popular geophysical and metaphysical texts from the 1870s to suggest that the succession of geomorphological transformations, compositional frames, and visual modes of the pursuit series harnesses ideas about matter, chaos, and human agency contain in popular Victorian narratives of Earth's development and cosmic collapse. In the staging of the geophysical trajectory, decoration is a key pictorial mode, which Burne Jones deploys both to inject chaos into the visual field and ultimately to reinstate order. The second law of thermodynamics, variously formalized and discussed in 1860s by J. Clark Maxwell and Lord Colvin, postulated that the cosmos was steadily approaching energy impasse. This was due to the irreversible degradation of energy from usable, transformable form into disordered waste or entropy. The heat death of the universe loomed large in the Victorian imagination. Even more terrifying, however, was the idea that mankind was precipitating cosmic breakdown by using up the Earth's energy resources for the advancement of civilization. By prophesizing the catastrophic obliteration of nature and the universe, geophysics and thermodynamics also made it possible to imagine worlds that might exist beyond visible reality. Geophysicists Balfour Stewart and Peter Tate proposed a geography and chronology of the cosmos woven together by the promise of energy regeneration and the post-visible continuation of life. In their popular treatise, The Unseen Universe, first published in 1875, they explained the existence of multiple linked orders of reality across which energy flowed uninterrupted thanks to the cementing medium of ether. In their unseen universe, the energy that brings the visible world to life was not used and lost in a scenario of maximum chaos, but endlessly reconverted in the genesis of invisible interconnected worlds. Their cosmology was premised on the correction of the first and second laws of thermodynamics into a principle of continuity by positing the idea that energy was able to travel back and forth between the visible and invisible universe, Stewart and Tate hoped to reframe the occurrence of waste and loss into a narrative of endless energy transformation and regeneration. Bernd Jones's letters and studio talks reveal a preoccupation with questions of human agency within the disrupted environmental and cosmological realms of his age. He read Alexander von Humboldt's Cosmos and Views of Nature, textual and visual accounts of the global interconnectedness of natural forces. More locally, he rejoiced in the destruction of the Brighton Rockingdean Electric Railway and condemned the English, the modern Carthaginians for, quote, leaving their traces everywhere in stout and soda water bottles, end quote. His ecological anxieties existed side by side with a fretful interest in the operations of the universe. He dreaded the approach of the star Arcturus, which was due to happen hundreds of years. He's recorded as resorting when unable to sleep to astronomical books, which triggered nightmares. What appalling things they can be, he said, as real as life itself, but with an added horror and terror, not of this life, even at its worst, but of the abysses of space and chaos. Perseus's trajectory through stages of matter, shot through with a consistent fear of material annihilation, enables the artist to fulfill his horrified desire to traverse the infinities of space and chaos. In Perseus and the Sea Nymphs, the hero, now outfitted in his armor, is receiving from the Saint Nymphs the gifts that will lend him divine powers throughout the journey. The winged sandals, the helmet of invisibility, and a pouch where he will safely store the Medusa's head. 
Here, Bernd Jones creates an undulating landscape of stratified materials, layering flexible slabs of rocks into mountain-like formations and laying a thin sheet of water in the foreground where the names stand. As Perseus pulls up his foot to tie the winged sandal, his pliable chest folds inward and away from the nymphs. His retracted movement is an extension of the material logic of the landscape. In Perseus and the Grae, rocks have congealed and turned malleable and elastic. An act of compression forces them into a, into a concentric pattern which is reiterated by the figure's arrangement into a circular network of touching. In the subsequent paintings of the series, Bern Jones encodes the exploration of substances in the discontinuous plotting of space, first in terms of abstraction in the death of the Medusa uh, on the left, and then in terms of vacuum in Persis and Atlas on the right. Bern Jones' deployment of various pictorial modes to reveal the behavior of bird matter finds suggestive correspondences in scientific attempts to picture the past and future states of our planetary system. Geophysics combined the reading of the fossil records commonly practiced by geologists with novel theories of energy physics in an attempt to recover the trajectory of temporal and material development of the Earth and the cosmos. The British astronomer Richard Proctor was among the popularizers of the physics of the Earth during the 1870s and 1880s. Proctor was a proponent of the theory of accretion as modified by the theory of contraction. He understood the formation of the Earth as a combination of solidifying processes of its early nebulous state in gathering of matter from various parts of the universe and mechanical processes of contraction and expansion of its crust. His articles, published in widely read Victorian journals and magazines, urged readers to embark on mental journeys backwards to the beginning of all things and forward to the end of all things. Proctor conjured up vistas of a liquid earth and surveyed ongoing processes of matter solidification while offering a metaphysical reflection on man's place among infinities. The eclectic model of the cosmos proposed by Stuart and Tate drew upon scientific evidence of impending cosmic death while reinserting the spiritually comforting tenets of eternity and, and immortality. As I mentioned at the beginning, the unseen universe they conceived of was responsible for gradually absorbing the energy due to be wasted in its linked visible equivalent and converting it in the genesis of a new region of reality. The monstrous supposition that in due time all visible things must come to an end, what they call the sacrifice of the visible universe, was necessary to imagine a world full of energy, a realm of spiritual relief and material regeneration. Perseus's mythic narrative is constructed as an action-packed journey through matter and space, which is imbued with the conceptual proposition of Victorian geophysics. In Bern Jones's own words, the future state of the universe would be something worse than the horrors of ordinary life, something more dreadful as it encompassed the infinitude of chaos. In an attempt to negotiate this infinitude, Bern Jones orchestrated this series as an unfolding geohistorical narrative. We can therefore read the first three paintings as depicting the processes of formation of the earth, its solidification, the addition and layering up of matter, the alternation of contraction and expansion, the resulting unevenness of the earth's crust and the gradual cooling of its core. In this sequential development, the hero is physically embedded in the workings of the earth and acts as an agent of material modifications. 
in the rock of doom, burn dome seems to accelerate the process of disarray of three-dimensional pictorial roles that began in the first part of the series. A pushing and pulling of perspectival forces pivoting on the outcrop to which Andromeda's change governs the composition. Perseus's forward motion is hampered by the uncertain placement of his foot in relation to the base of the rock formation. Like the illegible exchange of gazes with Andromeda, it constitutes a visual puzzle that results in narrative deadlock. The penultimate painting of the series, The Doom Fulfilled, is an alluring visual turmoil, the ultimate displacement of spatial legibility. We see Paris's attempting to thwart the multi-directional discharge of energy of the sea serpent by locking his gaze with the beasts, pushing and sliding onto its coiling body as the unstable amalgamation of rocks of the cave seem to close over him. Burn Jones retrains the outcrop from the previous canvas to engineer the flipping over of the unshackled body of Andromeda, as well as the passage to a new visual realm. The doom fulfilled corresponds to the climax of Perseus's geophysical journey. Strangely enough, it is a reversal of visual agency that makes action possible in the scene. Perseus had to become invisible to trigger the manifestation of the sea serpent. The defining action of the spinal feed is configured as a complete entanglement of bodies, which speaks to suspension and connectivity rather than resistance and separation. This entanglement, I suggest, is an equivalent for the linkage of visible and invisible realms imagined by Victorian geophysics. In the doom fulfilled, Burne Jones makes Perseus enact the necessary sacrifice of the visible world to use Stuart's and Tate's formulation. By abdicating normative visuality and physicality, the hero enables the genesis of a new realm. The Belfield Head, the final painting of the series, is the culmination of the gradual metamorphosis of pictorial registers towards the decorative, a consistent process across the series. The reconciliation scene is set in a lush garden hermetically sheltered by multiple layers, a verdant forest encroaching from above, a marble enclosure, the foliage of an apple tree. We come to realize that the barren, threatening landscapes of the previous paintings with their unstable materiality and mobile surfaces have paved the way for a luxuriant image of nature held together by tight interdependence. The triangulation of solid heads reflected on the fountain thematizes the quintessentially decorative matrix of the painting, characterized by insistent surface materiality, geometric patterning, and boundedness. Despite the happy ending, Perseus's and Andromeda's gazes still fail to meet. The plodding of their heads onto the water surface jointed together by the intervention of the Medusa's head causes the viewer to have access to only one of the figure's eyes. Reconciliation, however virtual and imperfect, is an effect of the Medusa's life freezing powers of her capacity to bring to a halt the processes of life. In a bellful head, the end of motion the cessation of the interactions of forces that make life on the surface of the earth possible presents a deadly unity and solidity, a perfect but fatal decorative form. Yet the metallic energized scales of Perseus's outfit and the lush foliage form a rupture in the locked, securely bounded surfaces of the visual field. I want to suggest that their role is to indicate that an activity of transformation and regeneration of the hero and of nature is still possible, that the succession of material shifts may go on. The configuration of love inlaid in the water surface affords a glimpse into the augmented spiritual and material dimension that the continuation of these processes may enable. 
The different topographies of the Persian series I have surveyed respond to the hero's passage with a sequence of morphological modifications. They gain increasing mobility and instability to the point of complete disarray, but finally they are tightly restructured. To chase down these modifications is to identify the gradual transformation of pictorial registers into a decorative realm. This trajectory and its culmination, I have argued, may be seen as visualizing the post-entropic world offered by Victorian narratives of cosmic development. The Pursuit series allowed Burne Jones to play out his cosmological terror, fabricate and experience nature's doom and safely land beyond it on the realm of infinite renovation imagined by popular thermodynamics. Decoration, with its, with its enhancement of aesthetic experience, serves as both catalyst and comforting solution to the inevitable draining away of the real. Georgiana Burne Jones writes of her husband's lifelong disappointment with the soft, too soft land of Surrey. She recalls Burne Jones as saying, I wanted some desolate bits and woeful tale or two, and to be told at such a point was such a battle, and by that tower was such a combat, and in that tower such a tragedy. I like other lands better, and now and then I want to see hell in a landscape. All that is like a silly heaven. The landscape described by geophysics and thermodynamics were imbued with the hellish quality that appealed to Burne Jones. To contemplate disintegration in the environment and the universe, to dive into the running down of material reality made it possible to reach a land free of waste and decay that lay beyond its boundaries. Thermodynamics ultimately delivered a prophecy not of loss but of infinite transformation. Those who venture through the destructive workings of the physical world were to harvest the redemptive outcome of this prophecy. Burne Jones perceived an overlap between the promise of regeneration of energy physics and the reformulation of visual agency through the decorative. Both thrive on the final dissolution of material reality, the suspension of its spatial and temporal parameters and offer, in return, a superior experiential mode within a matrix of enhanced material relationships. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Katerina. Um, and in the course of that, let's see the, the a number of attendees has, has crept up. We're at 84 from all around the world listening in on that. And I know from the chat box that there's already a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm and interest for, for, for your paper and your, your topic, including from at least one actual scientist who's in the room, which is very nice to oh, have. Wow. So welcome to them. <laughs> um, <Nice question. laughs> uh, for anybody who's, who's, who's new, um, welcome. Um, we are um, running uh, papers in pairings and we'll be taking questions. I'm sure there will be questions and comments uh, for Katerina um, after uh, the, uh, two, the first two papers. So, but um, I'm sure you'll join me in thanking um, Katerina very much for such a kind of rich and stimulating, a visually stimulating paper, which really uh, absolutely kind of tackles those relations between science and art, between imagination and, and, and materiality in, in, in really fascinating ways. So um, we will come back to you, Katerina, with questions, but we'll move on and now to our, our next uh, presenter, who is um, Stephanie O'Rourke um, from the uh, uh, um, University of St Andrews, lecturer in, in history, uh, at art, in art history from the University, University of St Andrews. Uh, she holds a PhD from Columbia and a BA from Harvard University. The paper that she's present, presenting today uh, relates to a Lieberhulme funded project on the relationship between landscaping and natural history in late 18th and early 19th century Europe. What a fantastic topic. Um, and she's been publishing in this area already, um, including papers in representations, 18th century studies and word and image. So uh, do join me in welcoming, virtually at least, um, Stephanie, uh, and her paper, uh, Picturing the Geological Sublime. So over to you, Stephanie. 
Great. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I'm so happy to thank you, Katerina, for that great paper. And I'm so happy to be participating in this, um, especially because I'm sharing some very fresh research. So it's very much the sort of thing that um, is in process and I'd really welcome uh, feedback on. Okay. Right. This is the historical age and this the historical nation, David Hume opined in 1770. Now, although he was referring to Scotland rather than to England, his words nonetheless capture the ascendant cultural status of history as an intellectual practice, and particularly in the first decades of the 19th century, a form of popular entertainment in Great Britain. If when Hume was writing, it remained a belles lettres practice, that century saw its consolidation and professionalization within the academy on the one hand, and its growing presence in literature, theater, art, and a wide range of cultural activities on the other. This state of affairs would seem to be confirmed by the integration of key functions of history painting into early 19th century Britain's most widely produced and consumed pictorial genre, the landscape. But Hume, writing of a historical age and a historical nation, mistakenly characterized history as a singular or monolithic entity. And what he failed to anticipate was that historical understanding in 19th century Britain would be not only emphatically plural, but riven by conflict and contradiction. This included the intellectual recognition of multiple kinds of historical pasts, as well as a growing interest in pre-human natural histories. So in an era in which communication and travel were precipitously accelerating the pace of daily life, quote unquote, romantic Britain faced for the first time an awareness of impossibly vast expanses of geological and non-human historical time, which is often referred to as deep time. And there's quite a lot of good scholarship on this in the history of science. Such conflictual temporality surfaced in landscape paintings by figures like Turner, whose canvases registered a visual field that was transformed on the left by the disorienting pace of steam powered locomotion and on the right by the relative insignificance of grand historical events compared with the operations of nature. Turner's contemporary and sometime rival Constable, another figure who treated landscape as a genre capable of performing the essential operations of history painting, counterposed the cyclical temporalities of pre-industrial agricultural labor and the social formations they undergirded against the fleeting effects of meteorological conditions and slower, if no less disorienting effects of social change. Now, beneath the conflictual temporalities I've alluded to in the works of Turner and Constable, though, lay a more fundamental challenge to the experiential and epistemological primacy of the human vantage point and its narrative historical framework in the early 19th century, as well as what I'm going to explore today, the incredibly fragile ground upon which it was located. The artist whose landscapes I believe are most thoroughly embroiled in this deeper challenge was also an artist famous for painting scenes not just of catastrophe, but of episodes in which the literal ground, often the surface of the earth itself, is thrown into disorder. I refer here to John Martin, uh, an artist few have done more to further our understanding of uh, than today's moderator, Martin Myron, um, who's helped us to understand Martin's work not only in relation to social and economic transformations taking place in an industrializing Britain, but also to the embeddedness of traditional artistic production in a modernizing marketplace of visual entertainment. Consider Martin's 1822 uh, painting of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum in 79 AD, uh, a quite monstrously large canvas stretching to 1.6 by 2.5 meters portraying a landscape in turmoil. You can see vertical jets of light shoot up from the distant volcano, illuminating from below the swirling vortices of ash and cloud that encircle the scene. And beneath it lies the finely rendered uh, city of Pompeii, and Herculaneum is a bit harder to see, closer to us the chaotic swells of the Bay of Naples, and on a narrow wedge of firm land in the foreground, various human figures fleeing the volcano's destructive powers. 
In portraying this famous eruption, Martin was appealing to a subject that had proven popular among British and French artists for several decades. J.M.W. Turner and Joseph Wright of Darby were both drawn to volcanoes as a pictorial engine of extraordinary luminous and coloristic effects. Widely cited as an example of the sublime, it was a subject treated most extensively by the French artist Pierre-Jacques Voller. I see his work below. In many portrayals, a spectrum of warm incandescent hues is contrasted with the blue tonalities of moonlight, much as the pyrotechnic heat of the eruption is set against the watery expanse of the Bay of Naples. Now, in the early 19th century, volcanic eruptions had become uh, a fairly prominent metaphor for radical political change, especially in relation to the French Revolution. Now, although the European political order was decidedly more stable by the time Martin was painting in the early 1820s, uh, social reform movements and millenarianism were palpably present in British life. And there remains some debate, at least about the extent to which Martin was uh, sympathetic to either cause. But more immediately and more concretely in Martin's case, volcanoes had become a spectacular and scientific attraction that could be found in pyrotechnic displays at London Pleasure Gardens, learned debates in the newly founded Geological Society, a range of theatrical productions, epic poems, and more. Its multivalent cultural presence was fairly typical in this regard of scientific phenomena such as electricity that we might now designate as popular. And this is something I write about more extensively in a book that I have coming out next year uh, on Cambridge UP. Much of the fascination with volcanoes resided in the idea that an apparently fixed topographical formation concealed within it surging forces capable of fantastical destruction. The mountain, almost a byword for permanence, solidity, and mass, could be revealed as merely a shell, an outer covering under which molten powers churned. It indicated that beneath one's feet lay a world whose combustive heat and power were antithetical to the conditions of human life. A world, moreover, in which latent pressures and unseen forces could gather undetected, only to suddenly burst forth and break open a formerly continuous material, narrative, and visual field. The pamphlet that was published to accompany the exhibition of Martin's paintings at the Egyptian Hall in London underscored several of these very features. So it describes, uh, and these are some quotes, refulgent expanses of fire burst from every part of Vesuvius and internal convulsions of the earth. Uh, it notes that during the eruption, houses no longer afforded security and chariots were not to be kept steady. Uh, these concerns were surely remote um, for Martin's contemporary viewers. Unlike London, of course, as the pamphlet notes, quote, the city of Pompeii is founded upon a stratum of lava, end quote. Yet those of us familiar with Martin's efforts to transform Britain, uh, the British capital's water supply and waste disposal systems, detailed in the dozen plus civil engineering texts he published, about which we know a great deal more thanks to the invaluable work of the YCBA's Lars Kokinen, uh, we'll also recognize that Martin not only understood the fabric of British urban life as something situated atop a sprawling network of subterranean flows, but that he was unusually alive to the risks of letting such forces flow or build up unchecked. Because the volcano revealed its subterranean mechanisms through a sudden intrusion into the surface of the visible, it also presupposes forces and causalities that normally reside beyond the threshold of ordinary human perception. Like the ancient depths of the geological past, such forces were inaccessible to the system of direct observation that was essential to empirical scientific knowledge production. The more dominant of the primary two views of geological history in Britain at the time, uh, uniformitarianism, held that the same operations that shaped the earth in the deep pre-human past run effect today. So consequently, um, to get to this past, you would extrapolate from what could be seen in the present and use that to kind of infer causalities and events that could not be seen. And while I don't have time to detail Martin's more concrete historical links with geology and paleontology, about which D David Bindman and others have written, um, such as his printed illustrations for geological books, it does seem fitting that Martin deployed precisely this strategy when painting Vesuvius, 
uh, drawing upon that which could be known through direct observation and then extrapolating from there. The pamphlet stressed that, quote, the painter has sedulously consulted every source of information within his right, which might enable him to complete his task with strict attention to historical truth, end quote, including an 1819 text by William Gell and John Peter Gandy, as well as William Hamilton's earlier and quite famous Kempe Flagre from the 1770s. One of the unusual things about Martin is that to the extent that we can even really call his paintings landscapes, they were rarely of environments that he would have observed firsthand. Included in the exhibition pamphlet was an outline engraving produced by Martin uh, of the painting identifying its major features and instructing the viewer how to move their eye through the scene. Now Martin was not the first artist in Britain to produce an engraved numerical key to his painting. I should underscore that this was not common practice really at the time. Uh, we also know that he displayed maps and plans of the region in the exhibition space, which viewers were encouraged to consult in order to better imaginatively locate themselves within the scene. Such supplements seem to presuppose that the painting lacks a degree of visual self-evidence or at least that there are unavoidable limits to its availability to visually communicate information. There is more to a volcano after all than meets the eye. But by far the strangest though of Martin's techniques for rendering visible and comprehensible an event whose historical occurrence and structural causalities were both inaccessible to contemporary British viewers can be found in his recourse to scale. Here's a quote that I'm showing you from the pamphlet in which he says, the elevation of the foreground in which the principal figures are seen is 348 feet above the level of the sea. Um, this elevation, he continues, makes it more than sufficient to enable the spectator to take, in, uh, take into view every city within the angle of vision represented in this picture. And as you can see, he, he goes on um, to, some, uh, to some extensive detail and the quote actually about scale continues on from there. So here, Martin employs scale as the defining frame of reference for the viewer, exhorting them to recall objects from the direct lived experience. And you can see from the bottom of the quote, I've included um, the magnitude of two remote objects may be formed from, of more remote objects, or may be formed from uh, the buildings, trees, et cetera. He's talking about what happens in the distance. So he's um, asking the viewer to recall objects from their direct lived experience the height of a man, the size of a tree, and to imaginatively project the relative size of epic and superhuman natural forces. It would be tempting to call this a deeply humanistic enterprise in which the measure of the human becomes an ordering principle for the entire visual field. But as I suggested at the beginning of my paper, the primacy of the human vantage point might actually prove to be far from secure. In painting the eruption of Vesuvius, Martin conveyed a scene in which the gradual accumulation of unseen uh, pressures violently break open the surface of the earth. In doing so, they mark a rupture within once continuous visual and narrative expanses and picture the transformative power of phenomena that cannot be directly apprehended until it is too late. As if to shore up or to stabilize the viewer's relationship to these effects, the painting appeals to an elaborate scaffolding of extra pictorial information. Firstly, through assiduous reference to documentary evidence grounded where possible in direct observation. Secondly, through an outline engraving and numerical key. And thirdly, through strict adherence to a principle of uniform scale secured through objects available to the viewer's everyday frame of visual experience. These features I propose are recurrent in his larger body of work, which itself takes on something of the volcanic, not obviously in the sense of portraying volcanoes, but rather in possessing some of the structural characteristics that I have been outlining, as well as luminous extrusions, latent flows, invisible powers, causalities and temporalities that fall out with ordinary human perceptual powers, the upending of previously stable boundaries and dramatic breaks within narrative continuity. And likewise, we can identify similar compensatory pictorial and explanatory strategies that are invoked by Martin to manage them. So I mentioned just one more example in the time remaining, uh, which is uh, Belshazzar's Feast, produced not long before his pyrotechnic homage to Vesuvius, of course, one of his most successful and today most famous paintings, uh, first exhibited at the British Institution in 1821, 
uh, the canvas portrays a biblical event set in ancient Babylon. On the left, you can see rays of light emanating from text inscribed on the wall by the hand of God, which foretell the fall of Belshazzar, the astonished Babylonian king who's um, in the lower right. And in the center, lower center of the composition, draped, draped in dark robes that set him apart from the gold flecked splendor of the feasting scene, the prophet Daniel interprets the script. Once again, we encounter the kind of vastness and immensity of space for which Martin was known, as well as the vertiginous repetition of architectural units by which its depth is plumbed for the viewer. The painting is also remarkable for its narrative simultaneity, its condensation of discrete narrative moments within a unifying spatial enclosure. And as the pamphlet, which was produced for the initial exhibition, the pamphlet would go on to at least 29 uh, editions, we know. Uh, as the pamphlet noted, the painting has, quote, its protasis beginning, its epitasis unfolding, and catastrophe, which the artists had the boldness and felicity of concentrating under the same point of view, end quote. So both continuity and its catastrophic disruption were united within a single visual field in Belshazzar's feast and situated in a graphic enclosure whose relationships were, as we might well anticipate, secured again by effects of scale. The outline engraving Martin produced for the catalog draws the viewer's attention to number 17. You can't see it in this, but he's one of the small figures sort of uh, in, the, in the center um, under the arc. Uh, quote, uh, number 17 scale of proportion, a figure six feet high by which the length of the halls is found to be one mile, end quote. That's from the pamphlet. As in the case of eruption of Vesuvius, quantitative relationality was invoked between a human figure and its non-human surroundings, at once an admission of their uneasy coexistence and an attempt to provide a framework through which they could be made mutually comprehensible. It was an awkward conceit to be sure and regarded moreover as an intellectual and artistic failing by several of Martin's contemporaries. So the artist um, Benjamin Robert Hayden wrote of this mesitant from a later um, uh, Paradise Law series that Martin did, quote, it is the grossest of all gross ideas to make the power and essence of the creator depend on size. It is vulgar to say, there, that horizon is 20 miles long, therefore God's leg must be 16 relative to the horizon. The artist deserves as much pity as the poorest maniac in Bedlam, end quote. It's not pulling any punches. Uh, so rather than transcend the quotidian metricized factual parameters of ordinary life, Martin seems to have installed them in the heart of a fantastical biblical epic, a disjunction that essayist Charles Lamb would call in 1833, Martin's impoverished deployment of the quote unquote material sublime. But scale served a very practical function in this moment too, as a mediator of temporal multiplicity and graphic unity with regard to the study of history. The most influential cartographic illustrations of the 18th century, Joseph Priestley's timelines of biographic and imperial history introduced, as you can see here, dates running at regular intervals along the top and bottom margins of his prints, of his timelines. As Daniel Rosenberg and Anthony Grafton have argued, this set a new standard practice for the 19th century in which it was widely assumed that uniformity of scale in chronographic diagrams secured the visual analogy between graphic space and historical time. So just a few words by way of closing. Scale effects made it possible to picture the historical unfolding of Western knowledge about remote regions and past events seen on the left, for instance, in Edward Quinn's An Historical Atlas from around 1830, in which the device of dark clouds being peeled back diagrams which portion of the world was known to the West at different moments in time. Although Hayden, Lamb, and others impugned Martin's recourse to scale effects, they were aligned with a much broader intensifying of scale thinking in historical knowledge, as well as a range of other fields. In the early 19th century, John Clancher writes, Quote, scale became not only the measure of fixed spaces, but also of moving and multipliable spaces and times. It thus became one of modernity's fundamental keywords for addressing an increasingly vast set of shifting relationships across the space and time of capitalist development and global reach, end quote. 
Multiscalar interactions were instrumental in conceptualizing relationships within large multi-level systems. This included energy regimes, colonial networks, economic structures, and increasingly diverse polities. Scale was not merely a cheap ploy to invite Martin's viewer to imagine that God's legs are 16 miles long. It was a major conceptual and graphic tool with which to think across large differentials of space, magnitude, and time. And in this way, it's precisely the kind of device that one might turn to in order to articulate remote historical depths so vast as to be otherwise unreachable to the human observer. Now, Martin was unusually preoccupied with the barriers to human observation and human understanding, both historical and phenomena, sorry, phenomenal, and many of the spectacular episodes he pictured, including the eruption of Vesuvius, were about the violent or sudden overturning of such barriers. His was a world in which subterranean flows, latent forces, and powerful accumulations broke through the fragile barrier human civilization had erected against them. His paintings revealed the thinness, the precarity of the paving that separated the space of human life, human history, and human monuments from the swelling mass of non-human forces and immense, if not to say immeasurable, spatial and temporal expanses. From this vantage point, Martin's recourse to scale and related informational supports acquires the status of a desperate, even quixotic effort to reassert the priority of the human vantage point against a stunning profusion of histories and causalities, as if to throw a bottle stopper into the gaping mouth of a volcano. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Stephanie. I'm sure um, everyone will join in thanking you for such an um, exciting paper, navigating space and time along with John Martin and, uh, and digging deep um, uh, to, to, to real effect. Um, uh, we've got, uh, we'll allow ourselves sort of 10 minutes or so to um, take some questions, uh, if that's okay with Katerina and, and Stephanie. Um, if you've got new questions, do post them in the Q&A box. Uh, we've got a couple of um, questions posted up already and a hand up, which we'll try to um, get to first, if we may. Um, so first up was uh, posted by uh, Jenny Gashka. Um, it's for Katerina. Um, uh, Katerina, you should unmute. There you go. Um, in relation to your argument, could you please say something about the relationship between the Southampton images of the Perseus series you showed us? I believe they are the cartoons, and the more finished series in the Staats Gallery Stuttgart. What happened between the two versions of Burne Jones's approach? Uh, to Burne Jones's approach, I want to say thank you for your exciting paper. Well, thank Katrina. you, Jenny, for for the question. This is this is a good question. Um, I guess one of the the main reason why I chose to focus on the Southampton cartoons was because they make the most complete record of the series. Um, Ring Jones never uh, finished uh, the commission, so I, I decided to focus on this because they gave me the kind of like expanse of uh, Ring Jones's attempts to reimagine uh, the world of geophysics. But I would say that if we consider the totality of the series, including the, the, the Stuttgart canvases, um, I guess they, they really speak to Bungen's interest in the analysis of change and the idea of redressing the earth in a way that shows its sequential development. And I mean, we can, we can, we could argue that, you know, he was never able to attain the perfect description of, you know, a geophysical journey that I argue that he had in mind by sort of like going back and forth between the cartoons and, and the canvases. And I hope that that answers your question. Great, thank you. Uh, off the back of that, I've got a question, uh, a point before we move on to the next one for both Stephanie and um, Katerina about um, Burn Jones and John Martin both have very kind of distinctive ways of painting. Their surfaces are very distinctive and seem to relate, have a kind of relationship with, with, with stony materials, whether it's architecture or sculpture. Well, I wonder um, uh, if, if you've got any observations or anything to, 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 to comment on that in terms of the, the kind of geological qualities of, 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 of either of these artists as painters. Stephanie, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Well, um, 
I have been thinking not so much about the paintings. I mean, I started this project at the very beginning of the first lockdown. So I haven't, I haven't seen one of these in person since I, since I started this about six months ago. Um, but I have been thinking a lot about the mesotints in particular in relation to, um, and this is more of a bit of a metaphorical lark, but I'm thinking about lap, lamp black as this kind of carbonic, um, you know, product of combustion. And um, the paintings are these sort of big, luminous, spectacular events that then get distributed um, and consolidated through lamp black in the form of these mesotints. Um, and I also find it very intriguing that his contemporaries and many, con many in the present think that those compositions are sort of less um, less tacky or more acceptable, more kind of refined, um, less awkward than um, mm. than those some of the objections that were made to the paintings. Mm. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, I am definitely thinking, still thinking through the materiality of Burne Jones's paintings and I guess the most interesting moment in the series would be actually not in the cartoons, but in the gesso panels that are part of Bern Jones's um, um, elaboration of the series. And yeah, I'm I'm thinking about gesso as this material that needs to set and solidify uh, to be able to create the kind of stony surface that you, mm. Martin, was, was, you were talking about. And is again a strange, you know transformation of matter from animate into inanimate and back into animate again at the moment mm. of artist of aesthetic encounter. So that, that's definitely something that yeah. I'm still exploring. Yeah. The sort of, yeah, trans transformative processes in turning yeah. mud into paint or... <laughs> uh, but we'll move on to, a, we've got another um, posted question for, for Katerina from um, Pola Duran. Asker, I'm sorry if I've not got you that right. I'm thanking you for a fascinating paper and asking. Um, I, I was wondering if you have perhaps explored any recorded interactions of Byrne Jones with the scientific uh, Victorian scientific world, which would underscore further his artistic acknowledgement of the latest revelations brought by the developing field of, of physics. So uh, are there recorded interactions of Byrne Jones with um, the Victorian scientific world? Uh, where there are in the memorials and in his studio talks uh, several um, hints at Bern Jones's interest in astronomy and especially uh, with the Percy series there's a, a posthumous um, um, uh, article about Bern Jones that talks about he the way he was thinking about Greek mythology and constellations in relation to the, 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 the story of Perseus and Andromeda. And I would say that um, if we want to kind of, um, if, if we're thinking about the, like Burn Jones's interaction with the Victorian scientific world at large, uh, and of course, Caroline Arscott has done magnificent work about underscoring this relationship. So that, that would be a good place to start to sort of start to locate Burn Jones within the larger um, scientific milieu of his time. Okay, okay thank you. Um, we've got a hand up from Sandra Gomez um, Todo. Um, I don't know if Danny or um, Ella could unmute Sandra to bring them in. No problem. Sandra, you're now know. muted. Sandra, do you want to ask your question? Uh, she's appearing as muted still for me. Oh. All right. Sorry, I'm having trouble with uh, unmuting her, unfortunately. Okay. Um, has anybody got got further questions they can post in the Q&A? Because otherwise we may move on and that will allow us time for um, Stephanie and Katerina to pick up any questions as well as the other panelists towards the end. So I'm sorry, Sandra, we seem to be challenged by um, the Zoom format. Don't be going too smoothly as well. 
No, I think I think I think rather than hold things up, let, 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 let's hopefully come back to your question um, uh, as we as we approach two o'clock, um, because now we've got two more um, papers. Uh, again, we'll we'll have the papers as a pairing and then move to questions for those two um, panelists, and then as time allows, pick up any questions um, um, uh, after that for for the other speakers as well. Um, we're moving now to um, uh, Joe Carr, who is uh, adjunct professor. Uh, of Architectural History at Syracuse University, London, and uh, previously Head of Critical and Historical Studies Programme at the Royal College of Art. Um, he is uh, 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 the public uh, 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 writer and uh, as a curator, and his publications include The Undome City, Contesting Architecture and Space, 2000, Autopia, Cars and Culture, 2002, and Bus Fair. Um, I think you probably get the prize for the best um, title um, of, of, of the day. Bus Fair collected writings on London's most loved means of transport, um, 2018, and has a book um, forthcoming with um, Stranger Tractor Press uh, on Alfred Watkins, uh, Man of Vision, and it's Alfred Watkins, which is your topic today. So um, over to you, um, uh, Joe. Many thanks, Martin, <clears throat> and good afternoon, everyone. So as you rightly say, my subject is Alfred Watkins, a name that um, is re reasonably familiar in England, but for our international audience, he was uh, a late 19th and early 20th century photographer, a scientist, inventor, and all round polymath. And the reason I, uh, I'm uh, searching him at the moment is that next year is a very significant centenary of something that he's associated with, which I will discuss in the paper. So as Alan celebrates its 50th, is celebrating the upcoming centenary of a particular event, uh, which has both catapulted Alfred Watkins from local interest to international significance, or perhaps even notoriety. Um, and one of the concerns about that is that this event, I, I'm sorry to be coy, but it, we will get to it, um, has kind of rather distorted his reputation um, and has deflected from his, I think, deserved reputation at one time of being a major photographer and photographic innovator. Um, we are doing a book and we are doing, we hope, an exhibition in Hereford, which is, is a, a figure from Herefordshire uh, next year to, to mark this event. And the reason I suggested this paper was I quite like the idea. Um, he, I imagined Alfred Watkins originally as a photographer working very much in the English picturesque tradition. And now I'm failing to move this forward. Um, the, the English picturesque artistic tradition, which of course is very closely associated with his native Herefordshire. The picturesque was originally articulated by two Herefordshire squires in the late 18th century and remained the kind of foremost artistic pursuit. And here is a work of, of a near contemporary of Alfred Watkins, the painter Brian Hatton, who was sadly killed in the First World War. Um, but <clears throat> whose work very much followed that notion of the picturesque of landscapes that, some, that somehow sat between the beautiful and the sublime, but in which the forces of nature were particularly strong. And I think this, the idea of the relationship with the forces of nature is particularly important because of course the picturesque was being theorized at the time of the industrial revolution. And it was exactly those forces, particularly water and a rugged topography that were being exploited by the pioneering iron masters of this region. And a little quote from Watkins's obituary to emphasize that he was such a supremely local figure. First and foremost, he was a Herefordshire man, as native to the county as, oh my God, I realized that my, uh, the video is, is obscuring my screen. So I need to somehow reconfigure that. Um, uh, uh, so I can't actually see the end of my own quote, which is slightly unfortunate. Um, but that, and the, the thing that's important about the centenary is it catapulted uh, this local figure and his relationship to the natural world into something very, very different indeed. He becomes somebody who represents the idea of the supernatural as a force within the English landscape. And I like that little dualism in, the, in, in terms of the subject matter of uh, natural forces, of looking instead at uh, at the rise of an interest in supernatural forces in the English language, in English culture. 
But of course, simple dualisms rarely have ever worked satisfactorily. And in the course of my research, I've come to realize that increasingly that whilst Watkins fits into the picturesque tradition and there is this interesting contrast between the natural and the supernatural, nonetheless, there's a third force at work, which is deeply important. And of course, is deeply important to the picturesque, which is that this is as much about human intervention in the landscape, about subtle um, and the subtle symbiotic relationships between landscape and its human occupants. So if you look at one of Watkins's images here, uh, an image taken in the very early years of the 20th century, um, it could be read purely as a landscape image. It is about the vastness of the Welsh borderlands and the vastness of, of the sky above it. But the subject, the, the, the title Cole's Tump, suggests something that, of course, this is actually about the prehistoric interventions in the landscape. It is a prehistoric mound that is at least part of the subject. And the trees themselves are things that grow there because it is a prehistoric site. And if we were to look at a, another of his images, um, one that I will return to later because it's of particular significance to me, um, this image makes it very much clearer that this is about a, a complex tripartite relationship between nature, natural forces, and human interventions. Here, both in the case of an artificial ancient mound and the eager uh, members of the local uh, history and archaeological society, the Woolhope Club, of which Watkins was the leading member. But the other interesting thing about these images is that they were taken purely in the context of art and archaeology. But because of what happens to Watkins later, these images get reused by him and become imbued with a whole different set of meanings as well. Um, and the other thing that's really important about Watkins is that as well as being um, an artistic photographer, and he was very much recognized, he won, the, he won a, a major award from the Royal Photographic Society uh, in 1910, is that he was someone who was also Whilst looking backwards often, he photographed uh, elements of the landscape and of human architecture and archaeology that were rapidly disappearing. He was part of that movement in the early 20th century to record uh, the traces of pre-industrial society just as they disappeared. Nonetheless, he was someone who also looked forward. He was an important scientific inventor. And this has uh, uh, a, a particular kind of resonance within this subject. In its kind of most literal form, he was he pursued all kinds of slightly eccentric causes. These are his own photographs of a, of a vehicle that he paid for and built, the Herefordshire B van, that went around educating, uh, in his mind, kind of rather um, superstitious and primitive villagers with proper scientific methodologies for the cultivation of bees. But rather more important, he became an inventor of photographic equipment. This is significant because photography was an elite pursuit, not just because it was expensive, which it undoubtedly was, the equipment was beyond the means of most people, but because it required uh, specialist knowledge without which you could not practice, not knowledge that was published, knowledge that had to be learned and acquired. So it is an elite practice. Watkins, despite being uh, an, an elite photographer, believed very strongly that photography should be popularized and um, made a, a variety of important innovations in photography. He wrote the first manual on how to take photographs, literally the first one that was ever published, uh, making, allowing photography to become a more popular medium. And then he invented equipment such as this. This is the first effective light meter. For the first 70 or 80 years of photography, uh, you didn't have light meters that could scientifically codify the intensity of light and therefore allow you to set the correct um, aperture and, and speed of your photographs. This is interesting in its own right, but what of course catapulted him into, and th this is um, him writing very, very simple manuals explaining how the art should happen. But on the right is him making use of <coughs> uh, the thing that kind of catapulted him in the first instance into an international realm, is that the photographer uh, Ponting took one of these bee meters with him on C Captain Scott's disastrous exhibition to the South Pole in 1910. And it was these things, this invention that enabled Ponting to take his extraordinary images of the Antarctic. And you see here, 
Ponting's own endorsements of the meter. So in a sense, um, Watkins was directly responsible for the recording and for the transmission of perhaps the last great exploration of a part of the world where natural forces were overwhelming. And of course, what's really interesting about these images is that they were intended to be celebratory. The book uh, that Ponting was to produce was to be a, a triumphant celebration of Scott's intrepid and heroic adventure to the South Pole. Of course, he died in that attempt along with the surviving members of his team. And uh, as a consequence, these images hold all those kinds of resonances of, of re recording, of being a kind of uh, images of mourning and of loss. But they still resonate very, very powerfully, these things. They are some of the most extraordinary images uh, to be taken of the natural landscape in its entirely unaltered uh, form with no human intervention uh, of, of the Antarctic. But then comes the event, the centenary, which transforms everything. It's an event that is familiar to many people, but I need to rehearse briefly. Um, also, the event has been like many Damascene moments, and it really is presented as a kind of Damascene moment, a moment of, of intense and immediate revelation. Um, sorry, I understand my, I'm being told my internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? It, it, it seems fine it at the moment fun? to me, yeah. yeah. That's fine. At uh, this moment of revelation, which transforms everything. The simple uh, explanation of this is that Watkins on commercial business was passing over a hill in Herefordshire uh, and was interested in objects in the landscape, the things that he had often photographed and researched uh, in his antiquarian practices and suddenly realized or thought that he realized that they lined in a straight line. Um, and he immediately pursued uh, this apparent kind of insight into the relationship between human artifacts and the landscape uh, very, very rapidly. He presented his findings uh, uh, in a paper delivered to the Woolhope Club, of which he was a, a principal member. And I can only imagine that these uh, men, and they were exclusively men, uh, of learning um, and of kind of rational science and history were astounded by this now uh, increasingly aged old buffer, making essentially making a fool of himself with his outlandish theory. But he quickly developed it um, and published it uh, within a year of his revelation in the book, The Early British Turquoise, which found immense and immediate interest, uh, a lot of criticism, um, but he then very, very quickly developed and produced in 1925, the book by which he is always remembered, The Old Straight Track. Um, and this book, expounds this idea that the landscape is actually conceals um, and, and largely conceals a network of ancient trackways. He takes a very kind of literal interpretation of it, that the uh, elements of the landscape that, he, that he's interested in, prehistoric monuments, standing stones, fragments of track, and topographical features of the landscape, uh, all align to create a series of, of connections for the purposes of travel and communication. Um, the enterprise is a deeply poetic one, um, and the, the passage that's often quoted in the old straight track is this one. Imagine a fairy chain stretched from mountain peak to mountain peak, as far as the eye could reach, and paid out until it reaches the high places of the earth at a number of ridges, banks, and knolls. Then visualize a mound, circular earthquake, uh, earthwork or clump of trees planted, etc., etc., etc. It's an extraordinarily uh, evocative uh, and a rather beautiful description of the landscape. And it could be uh, simply uh, a descriptive account of what's seen from the high points of Herefordshire and the other areas that he investigated. But of course, uh, there is this um, bigger explanation that comes. Not surprisingly, uh, there is an immediate reaction against Watkins's ideas because they come as a popular and non-academic challenge to the orthodoxies, particularly of the disciplines of archaeology and of ancient history. And most famously, uh, the wonderful figure of OGS Crawford uh, goes on the attack against Watkins. Famously, OGS Crawford, who was uh, an archaeologist and set up uh, 
a, a magazine for archaeology that still exists, refused an advert from Methuen, the publishers of the Old Straight Track, uh, on the basis that this was cranky stuff, and cranky was a word that OGS Crawford used. Um, but what's really interesting is that Crawford himself was had had a revelatory experience in relationship to the landscape. Sensational revelations do not often appeal to archaeologists, but when an Air Force friend showed photographs taken for practice near Winchester, I realised instantly that they marked the beginning of a new epoch in archaeology. So Crawford, using the innovation during the First World War of aerial photography, has himself uh, become someone whose whose revelations are revealing patterns in the ancient landscape. And I suspect his his antipathy to Watkins was not just on the basis of academic orthodoxy and rationality versus kind of amateur romanticism, but also on the fact that they were competing uh, revelations about essentially the same subject. <clears throat> it was, of course, a period in which things were being found under the earth that was transforming our understanding of matters above the earth, whether it's Howard Carter uh, and Tutankhamun, or on the right, uh, exactly contemporary with much of this debate, Mortimer Wheeler, excavating Maiden Castle, the great uh, <coughs> prehistoric earthwork in the south of England. And one of the interesting things about this, two of the interesting things is, firstly, that it inflects artistic practice quite a lot. And so, of course, Paul Nash um, <coughs> creates an artistic image of the landscape and the human intervention in it, just as on the right, Watkins's photographs were doing in a different context um, in the old straight track. But also, of course, it tapped into a popular relationship with the landscape that had vividly grown in the interwar years with government support and sanction. In reaction to the unhealthiness discovered in the population during the First World War, people were encouraged to move outdoors. And of course, this took on uh, uh, not only a popular, but a political aspect as well. Uh, one last thing about, about the two of them is that what they were in, concerned with doing was actually providing methodologies. And this is important because this is often what uh, Watkins was picked up on for later. So just as Crawford explains in very technical terms how you use aerial photography to um, investigate ancient remains, so Watkins explains with great detail how you use equipment in the home and the Ordnance Survey map. And of course, the delicious irony is that OGS Crawford was one of the people who had who worked for the, the Ordnance Survey and had created the maps that Watkins and his enthusiastic followers used. Uh, Watkins shows how you do ley lines. So they're both technical minds uh, addressing the same subject, but from very, very different viewpoints. <clears throat> but in terms of this relationship to a popular embracing of nature, of course, this is famously expressed in the mass trespass on Kinder Scout in 1932, the event at which uh, the, pri the private ownership of the great landscapes of England is challenged by a mass movement. But I ask you briefly, and I can't uh, afford to analyse this now in terms of time, these images of enthusiastically striped landscape or listening to impassioned speakers explaining what they're seeing is paralleled almost exactly by Watkins's Straight Track Club, the um, the organisation he set up for, for essentially amateurs and enthusiasts to go and explore the landscape through the medium of ley lines. And once again, we don't see people in athletic equipment or in hiking gear. We see people rather overdressed for the activity of, of yomping up uh, an old mound. Or, in the bottom image, of listening to Mr Watkins eulogising about the objects that they're seeing. Um, but what tra transforms this subject is the way that uh, very quickly, uh, a supernatural element creeps into the idea of the ley line. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned, of course, many of you will know that Watkins called his tracks ley lines. Um, it happens very quickly. Um, to an international audience, the Daily Express is not normally a place, the, the letters page of the Daily Express is not normally where you would look for any form of academic wisdom. But it's extraordinary how very early on, um, within a year of Watkins's uh, revelation being made public. Somebody in, the, in, a, in a newspaper suggesting one might almost reconstruct a forgotten and obliter obliterated road from the evidence of the ghostly legends attached to it, etc. And then um, recent scholarship has shown that the famous academic and ghost story writer Emma James, who at that time was researching a book on abbeys, a, a kind of guidebook to abbeys, that meant that he had to travel 
to lots of places and looks at uh, the old remains there. Wrote perhaps his most celebrated ghost story, A View from a Hill, in 1925. It's impossible that he'd seen the old straight track because that published in the same year. But uh, recent scholarship has suggested that actually um, the story is based on a knowledge of, uh, it was certainly written in Herefordshire, and recent scholarship has found that A, that it details the Herefordshire landscape, altering it slightly for, for narrative purposes, but that it was also written after a visit that James made to stay with friends in the local landscape. And indeed, it's been suggested uh, that the view that he describes here, uh, looking out from uh, a high ground across evocatively again, in the same language that uh, Alfred Watkins had used, similar language, that the view actually came from the tump that we've already seen, Cole's tump. And a recent paper has suggested, has shown how this is probably the place that M.R. James was evoking, albeit with a degree of uh, literal uh, of liberality. From there, unfortunately, the subject kind of escalates into what today is often known as woo woo. Um, an early novel by an extraordinary woman, Dion Fortune, in 1936, The Goat Food God. Um, she was one of the high, a kind of Crowley esque uh, high priestess of, of paganism and magic. And the Goatfoot God uh, is for the first time suggests the idea that actually ley lines suggest invisible, invisible forces within the earth, forces of power, possibly magnetic forces, and that underneath our feet, underneath, buried beneath our landscape, um, are these very, very powerful forces. Not only did it suggest that, something that, that has still not gone away today, but also um, she takes it to an international footing and links it, of course, not just back to prehistoric artifacts, but to prehistoric deities as well. The whole thing kind of died um, with Watkins' death in 1935. Um, but after the Second World War, it becomes part of kind of Cold War culture in the most bizarre fashion. Firstly, this French author, Aimé uh, Michel, uh, writing first in French, this is a translation, writes about how flying saucers, he believes, seem to have followed straight lines in the landscape, and therefore that probably the ley lines were some kind of navigational or directional device for uh, unexplained uh, inter, uh, intergalactic objects. Taken up by, again, a, a kind of classic Cold War thing by an ex-RAF pilot, Tony Wedd in 1961, who wrote a book called Starways and, Lands and Landmarks, which as a later writer says, it was like a Saturn rocket. It propelled the entire subject out of the post-Edwardian world of galoshes and charabangs and rural rambles straight into the age of Aquarius. And him and his organization were preparing for the eventual encounters, the close encounter uh, with extraterrestrial beings um, who would come in flying saucers and follow ley lines. And then in 1969, this famous book, The View Over Atlantis by Jean-Michel, um, takes ley lines and places them in a whole wider body of ideas and theories about uh, sacred places in the world, places of magic and ritual and religion that are linked by kind of mega global ley lines. And as one of his uh, followers said uh, in, in more recent years, that this view re-enchanted the British landscape and empowered a generation to seek out and appreciate the spiritual dimensions of the countryside, not least attract them to reawaken the sleepy town of Glastonbury. And of course, we all know what links then come uh, between Glastonbury as this site of ancient worship and uh, more, more recent cultures. Um, but equally, and this is really important, and it's important to the way in which we'll be treating the subject next year uh, in exhibition and book, we hope, is that Watkins becomes appreciated increasingly, uh, not for the kind of the more mystical or supernatural ideas, but for the methodologies that he promoted for examining and analysing and treating the landscape. And only the most famous example here, uh, and I'm sorry to do the, the awful uh, art historical thing of looks like, but nonetheless, point is evident here. On the left, one of Watkins's images, taken earlier but used in the old straight track, showing a straight track arriving at a Neolithical burial mound. Richard Long from 1967, and on the right, we have Hamish Fulton from 2011. And the um, Richard Long claims that he hadn't heard of 
uh, ley lines when he exhibited this piece for the first time. Somebody at the opening said, "Dear, you should find out about ley lines. Nonetheless, they are an influence. And in Fulton's case, the influence is very strong indeed. Uh, not only does he acknowledge it, but he came to Hereford to the extraordinary archive of material relating to Watkins that is held in Hereford, not just to examine material about ley lines, but because he loved the typography and organization and layout of the works that Watkins and people of his era had produced. And there's something self-conscious uh, in Fulton's work of reproducing the visual appearance of that material from the 1920s. Um, I, I need to finish um, and I need to get over a lot of material. But the, the only thing about Watkins and his relationship to nature and to natural forces and to the supernatural is that 100 years after his revelation, the debate continues. It won't die down. At various times, there have been academic attempts to kind of destroy this, you know, to put it to a side uh, to, uh, for all time. Uh, bad archaeology columns. And this book on the left, Ley Lines in Question, written in the early 1980s by two uh, landscape academics, actually just destroys mathematical basis for the lines. And they thought that it would put it to bed. They realized afterwards that A, archeologists weren't interested even in disproving the ley lines and people who believed in them uh, were hostile and defensive about these criticisms. But on the other side, um, the science, the pursuit, the popular art of ley lines continues. And this is a book uh, written uh, within the last decade, which attempts to, um, to kind of put the whole thing on a more rational basis. And I quote briefly, ley lines have been the subject of heated debate between ley hunters and archeologists ever since their discovery by Alfred Watkins in the 1920s. In the 75 years since their discovery, they've been attributed mystical meaning, been associated with prehistoric travelers, UFOs, invisible earth energies, ghosts, marauding spirits, shamans, madmen, and the feet of angels. Many attempts have been made to understand and explain the extraordinary phenomenon of dead straight lines of prehistoric monuments, etc., etc., etc. Not until now has it been possible to look back over the years of research, speculation, and theorizing to paint a coherent picture of the colorful history of lay hunting and to come close to an understanding of the phenomenon. So we are now in an age where ley lines have not disappeared and people are attempting uh, explanations of them and interpretations of them that, that pull back from the weird outposts of woo-woo. And this has been reinforced in particular by their, the, their re-adoption by writers like Robert McFarlane, who is a quintessential writer about the English landscape and whose book, The Old Ways, is a self-conscious, I think, reference to Alfred Watkins. And in the most recent edition of the Old Straight Track, published five years ago, McFarlane writes the introduction. But McFarlane does something else as well. He has this new idea, which I think is very interesting and we will use next year, which is that the English landscape is eerie. He writes very well about the eeriness of the English landscape. Writers and artists have long been fascinated by the idea of an English eerie, the skull beneath the skin of the countryside. But for a new generation, this has nothing to do with hokey supernaturalism. It's a cultural and political response to contemporary crises and fears. So ley lines becomes reinvested as a response to uh, particularly uh, ecological anxieties of our present age. Great. That, that, sorry, thanks thanks, thanks very much, Joe. There, there was some sort of warning alarm going off at some point. I don't know who that was, but that's, uh, there was a noise um, interrupting us there because uh, we, we, we should try to move that on. That was but me, actually. The, that was my, uh, own, my own warning. Ah, uh, well, there you go. You, took, you, you heated your warning very well. Thank you very much for such a brilliant kind of recovery of uh, 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 a rather than fairly neglected or, mal or, or maltreated maltreated figure. And for me, I thought all sorts of interesting resonances as well with um, John Martin, uh, as Stephanie was discussing, in terms of the, the kind of sublime aesthetics of his imagery, but also that perhaps kind of rather unjust reputation for crankiness and, uh, and eccentricity, um, uh, which is probably overshadowed, uh, overshadowed his, 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 his proper appreciation and understanding. So thank you very much for that. Um, do please post questions um, for uh, Joe, or indeed for our next speaker, and we'll come back to them um, at the end. But we'll move on straight away now to uh, our next contributor, who is uh, Toba Auckland Peck, who is a fifth year PhD student in art history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, um, uh, whose dissertation focuses on images of extraction, uh, mines, miners, and mining infrastructure 
in, into war Britain um, and locates the figure of the miner as an alter ego for the artist, uh, tracing the ways in which both instances of labor are engaged with the translation of landscape and raw material into productive commodities. Um, she has an essay um, forthcoming in uh, Court of Books Online, um, uh, Imagining the Apocalypse, the Abbey in Ruins and Ablaze, Staging Disaster at the British Empire Exhibitions, and speaking today uh, on Minerals of the Island, Tracing the Fossil Landscapes of the 1951 Festival of Britain. So over to you, Toba. Great, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, and also thank you to Anna, Danny, and Ella for all your organization and uh, to Katerina, Stephanie, and Joe. It's been such a pleasure listening to all of your papers. So today I'll be speaking, as Martin said, on minerals of the island, uh, tracing the fossil landscapes of the 1951 Festival of Britain. The pterodactyl in Graham Sutherland's 1951 Origins of the Land floats in the central strata of the massive yellow and orange canvas, its wings outstretched and its talons breaching the horizontal dividing line above its head. Its bright red eye and vicious teeth draw the viewer towards this incarnation of a familiar ancient fossil rendered here in its corporeal form. Commissioned to decorate the entryway of the land pavilion at the 1951 Festival of Britain, Sutherland leveraged the inclusion of the Mesozoic body to, in his words, provide a hint of prehistory. He rooted his audience in a moment preceding both the human body and the nation state. The pterodactyl, an indicator of this ancient past, is visually distinct from the other inhabitants of the picture plane, mysterious hybrid forms which waver evasively between ge geologic roads and mechanical monsters. In his work of the 1940s, Sutherland experimented with metamorphosizing human bodies into natural motifs. In this oeuvre, the pterodactyl stood out as an unusual moment of realistic rendition. The very physicality of this aberrant body is key to origins of the land, which itself at 14 feet stands over human scale. I argue that the dinosaur's form encompassed multiple incarnations, simultaneously fossil, living body, and combustible commodity. Sutherland had a unique personal exposure to the forms of geological substance, the natural, the corporeal, and the manufactured that are present in the body of the pterodactyl. Employed by the British government as a war artist during World War II, Sutherland documented the work of mines and factories, an endeavor that resulted in a rich archive of geological sketches and individual portraits, as well as a familiarity with the transformative relationship between mined objects and industrial production. The precedent of this undertaking reconstitutes origins of the land as an image implicated in modern modes of energy production and tied to the teleological undertaking of the festival itself. The Festival of Britain was planned by the Labour government as a centennial celebration of the Great Exhibition of 1851. The festival exhibitions were oriented towards British scientific and industrial progress, an intended antidote to the privations of post-war austerity and the waning power of the empire. The three primary experiences were the upstream circuit devoted to the land of Britain, in which origins of the land was the first object encountered, the Dome of Discovery, which narrated British achievement in terrestrial and space exploration, and the downstream circuit dedicated to the people. The two circuits enforced a deterministic narrative of British history, ending in modern industrial might. However, the glorification of the worker implied in this progression was contested by the opposition Conservative Party, with an unconfirmed quote from Winston Churchill dismissing the venture as three-dimensional socialist propaganda. In October 1951, soon after the festival's closing, Churchill's Conservative Party won the national election. The dismantling of the festival grounds in the fall of 1951, if not an active rebuke to the implied socialist leanings of the labor platform, was a clear symbolic rejection of the festival's aims. Addressing origins of the land, critic Tony Del Renzio posited that, quote, it was perhaps the most impressive failure of the South Bank, end quote. A monumental 14 by 11 feet, the canvas is awash in brash oranges and yellows and divided with dull gray lines that recall the shades of sedimentary rock layers. The highest layer recalls a fractured landscape 
with jagged geometric shapes rooted in the strata of gray paint. The placement of this semi-abstraction at the beginning of the exhibition's didactic circuit disconcerted visitors and critics alike. Acting as the first image of a procession encapsulating the origins of British identity, the painting appeared to refute the accessible triumphalism of the fairground. Sutherland encountered the model for his pterodactyl in the halls of the Natural History Museum, an 1881 Romanesque edifice in South Kensington. The institution was born of the Victorian obsession with scientific progress and national achievement, presenting scientific specimens, both local and imported, as confirmation of Britain's extraordinary imperial power. Inside, displays of subterranean entities from coal to gemstones to fossils were marshaled as evidence of the wealth of Britain's geological landscape. Origins of the land visualize the nationalist alchemy of the museum, where the exhibition of objects of varied provenance and value transformed each into a patrimonial treasure. The pterodactyl's fossil form remained a steady presence in Sutherland's preparatory sketches, as you can see here. But the final iteration of the dinosaur as cartoonish rather than scientifically accurate accentuated a museological construction. The same overemphasized features appeared on a figure not within the building, but on a sculpture adorning the front entrance. Transforming ecclesiastical elements into a scientific repository, gargoyles representing extinct animals were used in the building's ornamental scheme. The physical similarity of Sutherland's pterodactyl to this pterodactyl sculpture, which sits near the front entrance, manifested the political relationship between prehistory and the museum as a space of anthropocentric historical progression. Just as geological specimens and fossils shared the interior space of the museum, simultaneously scientific treasures and commodities, so did the pterodactyl sculpture trouble this distinction. In echoing the distinct visual attributes of a figure enmeshed in the fabric of the building, including its bulbous eyes and webbed wings, Sutherland embedded the institutional construction of scientific knowledge in the space of the composition. Sutherland's interest in the metamorphic potential of the human body began with his experiments with vegetal motifs in the mid 1940s. The artist explained, quote, why use these forms instead of human figures? Because I find it necessary to catch the essence of the presence of the human figure in its mysterious immediacy by a substitution. These organic forms give me a sense of the shock of surprise, which direct evocation could not possibly do." End quote. The surprise of the standing forms in Origins of the Land was accentuated by the bodily realism of the pterodactyl, a juxtaposition that added another dimension of physical substitution. But before the standing forms entered Sutherland's quest to jolt the viewer into a visual reinterpretation of the familiar, his encounter with rural industrial spaces during World War II gave him a mode of visually decontextualizing both the landscape and the human figure. These mine shafts and factory floors would typically, for reasons of safety, class, and national security, have been closed to Sutherland. However, his status as a war artist brokered entry into a hidden space that, in the case of the mine, was a part of the natural landscapes of his earlier work. This subterranean spatial parallel opened up new representational possibilities. Sutherland's landscapes in the 1930s and early 1940s had veered from his early etching practice, seen here, towards a scenery stripped of topographical specificity and identity. The open vistas and articulated botanical figures of the conventional British landscape were in notable examples, such as entrance to a lane and black landscape, both from 1939, flattened and reduced. The attention to textural layering rather than scenic expanse resonated with the limited framing necessitated by the looming walls of the mine in compositions such as the 1942 miner probing a drill hole. In the enclosed space of the mine, Sutherland found the visual resolution of his experiments with landscape. The mineral language of the mine shaft setting was perfectly suited to Sutherland's metamorphic project. He said in 1944, I feel compelled to make the object once removed from nature, end quote. The mind defined this space of removal. It was a material component of the visible landscape, but remained disconnected from the structures of the built environment. 
Though Sutherland focused on the textural possibilities of dirt, rock, and metal, his mining sketches included many human figures. This was unusual for the artist, who evidenced a great discomfort with picturing the human body. It is notable then that Sutherland's interest in the miner was significant enough to give rise to the series' unusual synthesis between landscape and portraiture. Underground, Sutherland could repudiate the artistic divisions between body and earth. There, the miner's headlamps were the only source of light, giving rise to a visual symbiosis between the mine and the miners. The miners gave form and visibility to the subterranean world, and the mine gave the miners an identity that transcended the everyday. Quote, is it, it was as if they were a kind of different species, the artist later wrote, ennobled underground and with an added stature, which above ground they lacked. The transition of the miner in Sutherland's mind from an inconsequential labor above ground to a primordial giant below was an act of both radical sublimation and political distancing. Edward Sackville West wrote of the series in 1943, quote, the mystique of nature, which Sutherland has expressed so eloquently in his landscapes, lives again in the inky gloom of these subterranean galleries and the miners themselves, helmeted and crested with acetylene flame, look as if they were made of the ore they are engaged in extracting. We are back among the primitive gods, end quote. Sackville West conflated the body of the miner constituted in the terrestrial realm by their labor and class with the accessories of their trade, the acetylene flame and the products of their work, the ore, to create the hybridic figures of mysterious primitive gods. Sutherland's uncharacteristic inclusion of the figure is born of the subterranean disintegration of the perceptible human form, an illusion that liberates the artist too, as Sackville West points out, fuse the miners indistinct bodies with the material of the earth. As the Battle of Britain raged, the incarnation of primitive gods opened up an unchanging ancient landscape that could be marshaled as both a fundamental national identity and a military asset, fueling the machines of war. Yet Sutherland's politically determined presence in the mine was evidence of an anxiety over domestic production that despite the metamorphic intent of the artist's work, tethered the miners to their identity as laborers. Though profitability of British mines had steadily declined from the end of the 19th century, undercut by international trade, the outbreak of World War II prompted a renewed investment. Despite this demand, old tensions between miners and owners over wages and workplace safety measures continued. The necessity of mined commodities to the war effort pushed these struggles into a space of conflicted nationalism, with newspapers pitting workers against the ongoing war effort. Strikes in Northern England and Kent in spring 1942, while Sutherland was in Cornwall working on his mining sketches, underscored the volatile atmosphere. Labor advocates called for nationalization and eventually the 1946 Coal Industry Act codified the inextricable relationship between national power and commodity production. By 1951, government investment and post-war international demand had remade the flagging coal industry into a vital symbol of British power. Central to the newly established National Coal Board was the miner as a central driver of the British economy. The Festival of Britain was a celebration of the productive power of the worker. In this political setting, Sutherland's miners performed a dramatic transformation, re-emerging in origins of the land as I argue the standing forms. Sutherland fashioned the grammar of these figures in the decade following his work in the mines, pushing the integration of organic form and human visage that he had first established in his sketches of the miners. Liberated from the small scale pages of the sketchbook, the confronting human dimension of the standing forms and origins of the land transposed the bodies of the subterranean gods out of the ancient enclosure of the mine into the expanse of the modern city. The animated pterodactyl also performed this transition, signaling both the primitive past and through its association with the museum, contemporary times. The rounded objects placed at odd intervals in each figure recalled the rounded brightness of the miner's lamps, while Sutherland's multi-textured rendering of the mine's walls, floors, and ceiling appeared in the dots, lines, and dark sections of the figure on the right. The synthesis of body, tool, and rocks is completed in the 1951 standing forms. 
It echoed the economic synthesis of minor government and mine achieved through the process of natural nationalization. The standing forms, however, clearly superseded or an organic fusion. Sutherland's composition demonstrated an awareness of the texture and form of industrial products pushed out of their elemental state. This ultimate metamorphosis turned a raw geological product into a utilitarian commodity. The factory induced transformation constituted the final iteration of the pterodactyl's prehistoric body. Ancient fossil matter was transformed into fuel. The Land Pavilion's brochure stated 220 million years ago, Britain was coated with jungle swamps, now dead forests entombed by rocks. From their rich black coals, we unlock the power of the primeval sun. The pterodactyl appeared as a mirage from the living forests and jungle swamps. But what was valuable in 1951 was the abstract disarticulation of smoke that could be achieved through the burning of rich black coals, the dissolution of the pterodactyl's body. Thrust into the energy politics of 1951, the pterodactyl as the indexical incarnation of the prehistoric moment was stripped of its temporal specificity and reduced to an ornamental symbol akin to the sculpture on the Natural History Museum's facade. Sutherland retained the physical components of production in the standing forms, pushing the narrative function of origin out of the prehistoric sphere of the pterodactyl and into the modern moment. The striated metallic figures shared the define, defining lines and complicated upper layer of Sutherland's wartime sketches of blast furnaces. He experimented with outlining these striking anthropomorphic objects in red chalk against unnaturally colored backgrounds a relationship between form and color that he repeated in Origins of the Land. The washed ink in the blast furnace sketches defamiliarized their physical placement, just as the oranges and yellows of Origins of the Land mirrored the fires of creation and the fires of production without providing a legible backdrop. Sutherland's practice of substitution enacted the same metamorphosis as the factory process decontextualizing objects from their original settings and reconfiguring them as utilitarian products. Sutherland wrote, basic industries such as furnaces, mines, and quarries symbolize a kind of eternal war, a constant conflict between the forces of man and nature's intractable material. The hybridity of his standing forms as figures cast from human, natural, and machine elements facilitated a possibility of success against this intractability of nature. Here, it is useful to bring in another mural work from the festival as a dialectical pendant to origins of the land. At first glance, Joseph Herman's mural Miners pushed against the inhuman abstraction of Sutherland's mythic gods. Herman was a Polish Jewish artist who immigrated to England during World War II. His interest in depictions of labor led him to settle in a mining town in Southern Wales for 11 years, a stark contrast to Sutherland's quick artistic sojourn. Herman won a commission to produce a mural for the minerals of the island pavilion. The festival posited a natural landscape that materially supported the aims of the nation, just as the museum leveraged scientific discovery as a confirmation of British exceptionalism. From the land pavilion, visitors would eventually process to minerals of the island and power and production. This path reified the conversion of natural products into Britain's nationhood. Herman's six-panel mural depicted six crouching miners. Their bodies crowd the claustrophobic picture plane. The smoothly rendered floor and wall provide no visual relief and instead, instead seem to suspend the figures of the miner in space. The man on the far left gains little height by standing. His very stature becomes defined by the constraint of the mine. As opposed to Sutherland's symbolic oranges and yellows, Herman's palette evoked the dark and the dirt of the mine. This realism is echoed in his treatment of the miners, who have cold, darkened faces, rough clothes, and bright headlamps. However, his rendering of their bodies as rough geometric blocks with overly large hands and exaggerated facial features forestalled an affinity between the viewer and these subjects. The static figures set on the rectangular panel with its simple background turn into a modern ornamental frieze, a decorative gesture akin to Sutherland's use of the pterodactyl. Sutherland's canvas, the so-called great failure, was an uneasy introduction to a celebration of modern Britain. This is, I argue, due to the simultaneous identification with and alienation from the human body evident in the three central standing figures. 
Though Sutherland was a socialist, his writings on the transformative quality of the subterranean sphere posited the power of the minor as derived not from an individual or class identity, but from a consolidation of their bodies with the ore they were tasked to produce. While the labor organized Festival of Britain produced a narrative centered on the national interdependence of nature and worker, Sutherland's composition destabilized this government sanctioned power dynamic. His formal solution to the perpetual conflict between worker and nature was the disintegration of the human form, a rejoinder to realism as a popular political gesture of popular legibility. The cartoonish familiarity of the pterodactyl was an insufficient distraction from the impending entrance of these uncanny life-size standing forms with their fragmented human-like visages into the present moment. Herman's minors, however, did not correct this alienation. In some ways, minors reiterated the nationalist teleology of the festival in which the worker was the inheritor of the wealth and potential of history and nature. Yet both minors and origins of the land argued that the actual body of the worker could be master of neither nature nor industry. In Herman's mural, the blocky workers were cast as base material, the identification between worker and landscape so strong that their bodies seemed to be made of earth. While Sutherland pushed the standing figures into the metamorphic metal world of the factory, Herman's miners were no less constituted by excavated material. The disjuncture between the aims of the festival and these murals was evident in the festival's model of a working coal mine, which used a tall tower to simulate the experience of standing in the depths of a mine. Through the display, visitors could embody Sutherland's vision of the underground primitive gods, while also staying tethered to their everyday identities. This experience evoked a subliminal feeling of the subterranean world that was tied to the power of the working class. Outside the tower were wax models of miners, photographs of mining communities, didactics about mining practices, and Herman's mural. The trick of the festival was to maintain the illusion of the integrity of the modern British body. It argued that the transformation into modern divinity could be achieved with the retention of individual subjectivity. This episode of optimistic self-determination was ultimately undercut by the imminent transition of the energy sector from coal to foreign de derived oil. Origins of the land was too close to the waning domestic industry of post-war Britain and the marked unpopularity of Sutherland's version of the prehistoric landscape is evidence of the uneasy place of the worker's body in the post-war struggle between the individual and modern industrial production. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, thank you very much, um, Toba, for uh, rounding off today in terms of uh, presentations. Um, thank you for that. Another paper, again, sort of focusing on transformations and really um, embedding that in its historical um, moment. And, and meaning so so thank you for that um do uh we've got that's kind of 10 minutes or so um which we could use up uh for questions and comments um, more broadly but um any questions for joe and toba please do pitch them in we've got a couple of uh, lined up um uh, which we'll move on to now if we may um one of which is the kind of question that curators really love um it's for joe and it's from uh, julia elkington who um uh, yeah, sorry. Who uh, who is a Melbourne resident and asks um, uh, says she'd be very interested in attending your Hereford exhibition if it comes off. Um, where will it be advertised? So I suppose Joe, it's, it's, a, it's a question of 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 of, where, of when and where. And uh, very briefly, the exhibition will at least start in the Hereford City Art Gallery and Museum, which is the appropriate place. Uh, Watkins was heavily involved in it. It's where the Woolhope Club lives. Um, the exhibition would have been. Uh, next June to mark the centenary of his Damascene moment, but it may get shoved back simply because of the problems uh, at the moment of research and funding caused by our current situation. Great. Um, I have no idea where we'll advertise it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, okay. But thank that, you for the interest. Yeah, that, that was, uh, that was um, lined up. Now we've got a question uh, which has just come in. There's a question which we'll go back to from Robert, Roberto Fernandez. Um, but the question has just come in, I think, not quite clear about the format from Mark Hallett, but anyway, it's for Toba. Um, does Sutherland's picture evoke a piece of statuary in three foreground figures are understood as standing on a kind of plinth? 
um, a painted monument following on from modernist public sculpture at and Hepworth and from ancient monuments too. So again, is there sort of a question about the relationship between sculpture and, and, and uh, graphic or, or painted art? Toba. Great, thanks so much for the question. Uh, and I will note, uh, many of you might also be familiar with Henry Moore's drawings from his time as a war artist. He also completed a very similar series to Sutherland. And there's a lot of scholarship saying that Sutherland was actually looking to Moore as he is going down into the mines himself. So I think that there's definitely an awareness uh, in Sutherland's part of Moore's work building on to that experience after the war. And Moore, of course, does also have a um, quite large monumental sculpture at the Festival of Britain. So I think that certainly there's a way in which the frontality and the size of the standing forms have a sculptural element. And I think that uh, my argument about the material and thinking about the way that that is built up from these factory materials, the metals, as well as the bodies of the miners really do speak to that as well. Um, and another thing I'll note that I've been thinking of this image in terms of is actually a museum display case as well, the way that the strata actually also can be read as shelving. So I think that Sutherland here, as you point to, does have really an awareness of the display and the bodily form uh, of these figures coming into the space of the viewer in a really three-dimensional way. So thank you. Right, thank you for that. Um, uh, we'll go back to a question uh, uh, from Roberto Fernandez, um, which was pitched earlier on and is directed to um, anyone and everyone. So it's for, for all the panelists, uh, but it may, it may be actually Toba, you might want to um, lead on this as we're straight on from your paper. Um, Roberto says he is a, a geomorphologist interested in the processes that shape the landscape. Of particular interest are meandering forms formed by, sorry, meandering rivers formed by erosion of loose sediment, abrasion of bedrock, melting of ice or dissolution of limestone. How interested are artists in the actual processes that shape, that shape the landscape as opposed to only their visual and perhaps obvious outputs? Uh, perhaps you could share examples of artists depicting the processes themselves and not only their consequences. So it's, yeah, so it's a question about the, about the, the, the actual processes that, that, that shape the landscape. Well, I mean, I would say in my context that in a way there's this middle question of artists looking at mind materials as a way of accessing and thinking about the landscape. So in a sense, the understanding of the actual processes, at least for uh, the groups of people that I'm looking at for my dissertation really are looking towards the use of the materials in a factory transformation in that process. So I think that in my case, at least they're less knowledgeable about or interested in the scientific ideas that undergird uh, the creation of something like coal and rather it becomes this fantastical process of thinking about the pterodactyl and the ancient forests and jungle swamps. So the metaphorical quality I think is forefront rather than the uh, actual scientific knowledge. Mm. Press. Oh, so Anna. Yeah, I, I was hoping to comment on just how, I, I guess one thing that seemed to pull all of the papers together was your sense of the sort of um, the productive force of kind of speculation when it comes to mm. these, uh, each of the artists encountering the data of, um, of, of science. Um, and well, with Toba, you know, um, Graeme Sutherland's kind of um, pointing out of the constructed nature of the, of this, of the history of the kind of natural history science that he's he's referencing the pterodactyl. I wondered if any of you could comment on that, um, those kind of uses of theological speculation, magical speculation, and um, more broadly in, in, in relation to this. Um, well, I would certainly say that speculation was, was, was seen as Alfred Watkins's Achilles heel. It's where he was most obviously attacked. And reading the book, I mean, the book is, and his literature is more interesting uh, as a series of speculations than it is as a kind of rational or coherent argument. Um, there are leaps of fancy that go from the geology of the soil through to prehistoric archeology, span through to etymology. He, he looks at links in the landscape with language. 
all of which are fascinating, but all of which are highly speculative and, of course, are very easy to shoot down with, with modern science. I think the interesting thing for Watkins uh, is that he was a scientist as well as an artist. So I think it must have been very difficult for him to, to involve himself in a body of ideas that actually contradicted, uh, that confounded the rationality of his otherwise rather scientific brain. Maybe I'll start to pick up on that because we've got another question come, which has come in, which might actually relates back to this, which is from, from Julia Elkerton again. It's directed at that Katerina, but I think it opens up something rather interesting. Um, Katerina asks, oh, sorry, um, Julia asks Katerina, how did Burn Jones reconcile his interest and interaction with the scientific world with his very romanticized depiction of the Percy oh. story? And actually, I think that, that, that maybe opens up a question for the day as a whole around how the interest in the geomorphic or the engagement in the geomorphic seems, uh, I mean, does it, does it highlight a divide between the scientific world and the world of imagination? Or does it actually form a kind of bridge? Does it, does it bring those worlds together, which might otherwise um, seem to be um, distinct and apart? And really, kind of what, are the, what are the tensions and what are the conflicts that might be involved in that? Um, Katerina, as it was asked to you, yeah, um, I think to your point, Martin, that really the um, like geomorphic uh, knowledge is really a bridge between Burne Jones's imagination and you know his more sort of scientific or scientific related um, interests in fabrication and transformation and and, and metamorphosis. And I think with uh, with the Percy series, what what is interesting is that, um, and with Burne Jones in general, that he his uh, his his landscape, his painted walls have been variously interpreted as this, you know, dreamlands, this fantasy worlds, these visions, and I think that I I do agree that they are romanticized, but they're also shot through with this consistent fear of dissolution and instability and annihilation, which I think speaks to the kind of scientific anxieties and concerns that geophysics and descriptions of geomorphological transformations were really bringing to the forefront of uh, Victorian culture. Would anybody else like to like to speak to that topic, Stephanie? We're thinking about jo John Martin sitting. Perhaps, I mean, I would say perhaps awkwardly between civil engineering and scientific worlds and the world of spectacle and artistic spectacle. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think few few know more about this really than than you do, of course. Um, and it's also, um, you know, over the course of the 19th century, we see the professionalization of a lot of these practices. So um, engineering is a very kind of amateur pursuit, um, something that I was thinking of with um, uh, Toba's paper as well, is um, there, the really rich tradition of the sort of poet uh, mining engineer. So um, you may know that Goethe and, uh, and the and the German um, poet Novalis were both kind of actually uh, civic mining engineers. Um, they sort of oversaw regional mines. Um, in terms of the extent to which these are ever resolved, I mean, obviously in the, in the case of Martin, um, his efforts were very unsuccessful in his immediate uh, horizon of experience, but later were, um, later had kind of greater recognition. Um, but I don't know if we really need to or if we can resolve these. Um, I think what I was trying to do and what the other panelists were surely doing as well is thinking of these as sort of different spheres of cultural activity that will kind of be cross-contaminating uh, but never can be sort of fully resolved or um, one explained by the other. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, we're, we're running a little bit over time, so I think this will have to be the, have to be the last question, uh, which is from um, Stephen Green, um, who I think identified um, themselves earlier as, as a physicist, um, as one of the scientists in the room, um, and it's for Joe. Um, I have a question for you, for Joe. Your talk has opened my eyes about Alfred Watkins. Um, I was brought up through my interest in archaeology to look down on his ideas and view him as rather a crank. Would you agree that Watkins' reputation has to a large extent been sullied by an association with those who later picked up his 
ideas, but has extended them too far. And um, well, I'm um, in, in the in the business at the same time of, of answering um, somebody's comment that they're quite upset by what they perceived as my dismissiveness about the more esoteric elements of Watkins's ideas. Um, I, I I actually don't think I'm interested in either proving or disproving. Um, Watkins's theories, or even the later interpretations. In fact, one of the things we want to do is to bring these ideas together for the first time. There's been a lot of interest in the various elements, either on the supernatural end or on the rather more rational end of uh, ley line kind of uh, discourse. Um, but they're, they're kind of pursued separately, and I would like to bring them together. What I do think is that Watkins's revelations uh, and you know his writings about ley lines have obscured his own reputation as an important innovator and pioneer, and indeed as an extremely fine photographic artist, whose reputation in his own day was considerable uh, as, as the producer of landscape photography and so forth. Um, I'm really interested in, in the kind of more extreme elements of ley line theory. Um, and I think that it's almost impossible to detach the debates about ley lines from either end of that kind of spectrum. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and thank you, Joe, for, for picking up on that earlier comment, which I which I hadn't hadn't seen, which I think was kind of addressed to you privately, but was 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 in the chat there as well. So um, uh, I think thank you for that and for running off and, and also kind of emphasising, you know, the sense that that today has been about um, recovery across the board, really, and actually recovering links between science and and art and between imagination and 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 and, and science. Um, um, and uh, recovering figures that sometimes have been rather um, overlooked or overshadowed by their reputations uh, and, uh, uh, and bringing them back into kind of art historical uh, interest and, and historical importance. Um, that alongside the, um, the, the richness of the individual papers and the amount that's been covered. I see we're, we're, we're seven minutes running over, but my, I have a feeling that we've covered so much ground in terms of time and space and cultural and political context. It's amazing that it's only, only seven minutes. Um, and any, any set of um, uh, academic papers that managed to pack in uh, dinosaurs, UFOs, volcanoes, magic and ley lines, I think is actually doing a, a pretty good job. I think, I think we can't be, uh, I think we can feel that there's been some, some, some real kind of um, achievements um, um, to, today alongside all that, all the great kind of art historical analysis and, and insight that we've seen. So um, do um, join me in, these thanking our four um, contributors today for such um, fantastic, rich uh, uh, and uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, material. So th thank you, thank you all. Um, I will close the uh, seminar at that point, uh, but point you to the next event, which is on the 8th of October, um, Plants and Animals. Today has been rocky, but in the very best sense. Um, next time is going to be a bit more um, fleshy and, uh, and, and or organic. But uh, uh, that is on the uh, 8th of October at four o'clock. So uh, I'm sure uh, many will be returning, uh, returning to that on the basis of what, of what you've seen today. So uh, thank you to all our speakers and thank you to everybody um, in the room for your contributions and for your uh, attention um, through, uh, through today's event. So thank you very much. <laughs>